top of my head, there's like half a dozen at least movies that we could have done just with the other people at this show. You are amazing. Yeah. Thank you. I guess you could do, uh, I guess, three degrees of Bill Paxton. Pretty much, yeah. Well, now it's one degree. Please don't, though. <laughs> I feel bad for Kevin. That, that's going to haunt him to the grave. So, uh, I mean, you haven't done a whole lot of these conventions. You've done a few. I've, I've, a I've never done the professional signing. This is the first time. First time. And uh, Guys. Hey, thank you. Thank you. My, my accountant thanks you. <laughs> my wife thanks you. <laughs> my children's children thank you. It's better than the SAG pension, let me tell you. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. This is significant for me to be here uh, because this is the biggest reunion of the Aliens cast since we were all together when we made the movie and when, when the movie premiered 27 years ago, I believe. And uh, so Sigourney Weaver's coming in tonight. And uh, yeah, yeah. They're all here. They know you're here. So, um the thing that has always intrigued me about you, it's actually your face. <laughs> you have like these amazing facial expressions and you're so expressive and you have these amazing characters. How do you, how do you find the energy to, su to sustain that? Sometimes it's difficult. Uh, I actually have had my teeth fixed since Weird Science and some of those. The, the, the gap was too big. And when we did Apollo 13, I had uh, I had some holes in the side of my head that I had to kind of have kind of puttied up. But uh, you know, uh, I I've I've always liked characters that were theatrical, that that are you know I I, I think you should try and relish the part if you can. And uh, I've played a lot of stalwart characters, and to me they're not as much fun as playing a villain or or more of a character part. You know, I'd, I'd much rather play Chet than a lot of other roles. Uh, yes. <laughs> Chet is a god. I can do a lot with this. But uh, I've lately been getting to do some fun stuff. Uh, I've got a movie coming out uh, opposite Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt called Edge of Tomorrow. And uh, I think I got the job because it, it, it's, it's got a lot of DNA and aliens. And uh, they needed somebody to say, game over, man. I, I don't know what that's from. What's, what's that from? Ah, I have no idea. Some I can't remember. But uh, that's coming out June 6th. And uh, I, I play a platoon sergeant. And uh, we're on the eve of a counter-invasion. Uh, an alien horde has taken Europe, kind of like an infestation. And uh, we're going to try to storm the beaches of Normandy with an allied force. And you know, get a little payback against these uh, creatures, but um, uh, Tom Cruise's character keeps dying in the battle and then waking up, and it's he's got to happen all over again. And uh, I'm his platoon sergeant. I've been told he's a coward who has been impersonating an officer, and I, I'm not mad at him. I'm, I'm telling him, oh, you're going to be born again, son. I say something like, you know, uh, combat is the great redeemer the fiery crucible in which the only true heroes are forged. <laughs> Is there a role that you've done that you have found particularly life-changing, profound, something that's really affected you more than maybe other roles? Uh, well, I'm taking on a role right now that's already kind of been kind of profound in so much as a, a, it's a distant family relation. I'm going to play Sam Houston, the father of the Republic of Texas, another Western town just just south of here. Uh, and uh, I've been doing a lot of research on that. His mother's name was Elizabeth Paxton, and she was from uh, Rockbridge County, Virginia, where my family's from. And uh, I've been doing a lot of research on that. I was just down in Huntsville, Texas, where Sam Houston lived and where the museum is, and I'm going down to Virginia next week to do some more research. As far as roles that have been profound for me, I think probably working on Apollo 13 uh, and Titanic were probably two of the most profound. Um, not so much because of the characters I played, but because of the experience of, of making these movies. 
Uh, Apollo 13 was amazing. Uh, Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes were uh, around when we made the film. I was, uh, it's kind of an interesting story. I went down and they arranged for me to fly down to Cape Kennedy and spend the day with Fred Hayes. That's the character I played in that movie. And he was the Lem pilot. And uh, we were, he was driving around, we were driving around and there's, there's two Saturn rockets that they never fired. The last mission was 17. Gene Siernan was the last astronaut to step off the moon. And the program, they had 18 ready to go, and they had 19 ready to go, and they canceled the program after 17. And one of the rockets is laying on its side at Cape Kennedy, and one of them is uh, down in Houston. And as we drove by the rocket, he said, uh, he just kind of said wistfully, he said, yeah, and that's my rocket. And that was a kind of a wild thing to hear that guy say. Um, Obviously, on Titanic, what, a, what an incredible phenomenon being a part of that has been. But uh, a couple years after the movie, Jim Cameron invited me to go on, an, on, a, on a second expedition to the, to the wreck of the ship. And he asked me to go along. I, I thought he was kind of putting me on. And, uh, and I never dreamed I'd actually go down to the wreck itself because it's, it's quite an ordeal to get down there in these uh, Russian near submarines. But uh, I thought I was going to be on the ship and maybe, you know, throw a blanket around him and give him a margarita, you know. <laughs> hey, how was it down there? Two and a half miles down into the abyss. And uh, he said, I want, you to, I want you to go on some of the dives. I'm like, yeah, sure, okay. And um, I actually tried to get the Lloyds of London to uh, insure me, and they wouldn't. But uh, I got to tell you, I went on the first dive, and it was pretty amazing. I was, I was kind of freaking out when they put me in, when they closed the hatch, and you're kind of bobbing around, and it's like being basically the size of the interior of an old Volkswagen Beetle, and it takes about two and a half hours to descend 12 and a half thousand feet in the, in the North Atlantic. I mean, this is a place where, the, you know, after a couple hundred feet, the sunlight doesn't even penetrate it. And, it, and by the time you get down to the bottom, they've turned off all the, all the they've, they've just kept a basic monitoring system, but they turn all the power off, so you basically kind of do this free fall to the bottom of the ocean. And by we, then we turn power everything up. You hope it's all gonna power up, and then they shine the light down. We're about 10 feet above the seafloor, and it really looks like the moon down there. And we look up at the radar and you see this kind of knife shape, and that's the bow. They, they like to try to land away from the ship and then motor up to it. And as we motored up to it, I looked, there are these little portholes, they're not very wide. And I looked up and I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the bow of the Titanic and I'm thinking, my God, there it is. And uh, even now, I, I feel like it's an experience that I, I felt like I dreamt more than I really did. But... Um, that was, that was something, but the, the, the story is that the second dive, I, I, I went down, it was great, I got back, I survived, I still had young children at home, and uh, the next thing I knew, Jim said, I, I need you to go, I, we're, we're going out again, I want you on that dive too, and I, I kind of got, I had a little apprehension, I felt like I had kind of cheated death, I mean, we're talking about Davy Jones' locker, and the price of admission is usually your, your life. Uh, I was thinking, nah, I don't know. So I had a really rough night the night before, and and we all had a breakfast in the galley the next morning. And I, I was going, I was looking for a moment to kind of pull Jim Cameron aside and say, Hey, Jim, I'm just really not up for this today, and I was kind of had kind of got cut some pain, and so, you know. <laughs> and I so I I, I go up, I, I pull Jim aside, I said, Jim, what did I? And he says. Uh, he goes, well, you're, you're going. I, I go, I am, I am, Jim? <laughs> yeah, you're going. See, the Russians have a, are very superstitious, he tells me, about any last-minute changes. Unless you've, you know, severed a limb, you're going. But, but I have to say that I was kind of relieved to have the decision made for me. Right. And uh, that turned out to be an incredible dive, except when we came back, the sea state had gone from calm to 15 feet, and by the time we surfaced, uh, they, they, they launch and they recover these mirrors, 
in two different time intervals, so about a half hour apiece. Well, by the time we got to the surface, uh, the, the, they hadn't been able to, to recapture and bring the other mirror on the, set, on, the, on the ship, so we just bounced up and down. And uh, it was really like being in a washing machine, and uh, I don't think I've ever thrown up so much in my life. <laughs> it, let's just say, when they open that hatch, I was going to ask if you got nasty. seasick, and I thought that would be too personal. <laughs> oh, no. No nothing's, no, nothing's too personal here. Oh. I feel, it's, I feel like we're having such an intimate conversation. Yeah, we are. I was going to wait for the serious stuff. All right. <laughs> so did you, did you have an indication when you read the scripts for Titanic and for Apollo 13 that these would be special films for you? Yes, absolutely. I, I actually tried out for the Kevin's part of Jack Swigert. And um, ah, this was one of those things, I remember I was close to a birthday and I thought, you know, and I, I felt like I, I think I read a couple of times for it. And I, and I, and I heard that Kevin Bacon was probably going to, was going to get the offer and ah, I just thought, gee, how many more times can I go through this and get very close to a, a part and almost get cast and then it not happen. But, uh, I, but at that age, I think I was already, I don't even know when that was. I was, pro I was probably already in my late 30s, so, yeah, I was probably like 38. And so it was a little too late to, you know, go into medicine or rocket science. <laughs> so, uh, so I remember getting a call from my agent saying that Ron Howard wanted to call me. And I thought, oh, he's going to probably say, gee, you know, good job, but I'm going the other way. So. Yeah, I was told when this call was going to come in, and so I get the call and uh, from Ron. Hey, Bill, it's hey Bill, it's Ron, and uh, Ron Howard. Okay, cool. And uh, I, I went ahead and decided to take the high road. So I said, um, I think Kevin's a good choice for Jack. And he goes, No, no, that's not why I'm calling you. That's not why I'm calling you. What would you think about playing Fred Hayes? And so now I'm like trying to, you know get my wheels turning around because it's a completely different character and I'm saying well, well, well yeah yes oh yeah sure Fred Hayes would be great and he said well look I won't keep you hanging long but uh, I just wanted to call you and to see if you were into it and uh, I go great great Ron he said okay and I hung up and the next day I got the part I don't know what happened but I think another actor was kind of in line for it and, and somehow uh, they couldn't make his deal or whatever and that was a life-changing experience for sure, absolutely. I think that's, that's the only movie that I cry at the end with sheer relief. Mm. That, like, it doesn't matter how many times I watch it, at the very end I'm in tears just at, at the relief that you guys m made it. Spoiler. I, 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 <laughs> that's okay. I, I kind of, I, I get worked up uh, about the launch sequence and uh, Tracy Reinert, Penny Marshall and um, Carl Reiner, Reiner's uh, daughter, she plays my wife in that, and there's a great shot as the thing's taking off and it cuts to them and, the, you know, they're the wives and they're in the stand and Kathleen Quinlan and she's doing this thing where she's crying and I, that always gets me. But I, I have a, a, another Apollo 13 story that I don't think I've really told in a long time, but um, we all were invited to the White House and this was when um, President Clinton's administration was riding high and they had a special uh, dinner and a screening in the White House screening room. And I got to go up there and uh, Tom Hanks was there with his wife and Kevin Bacon and uh, Gary Sinise, Ron Howard, Lou Wasserman, the famous old, the last mogul of MCA Universal, he was there. And we all went downstairs, uh, we had this dinner downstairs and then we went to the White House screening room and we all went to use the bathroom and there I am at, a, at this, these, these these three standing urinals, and there I am between Tom Hanks and, and, and President Clinton. And they're just talking away, and I couldn't even urinate. I just... <laughs> ah. so, but that, that was another story. I didn't mean to get into that. But, uh, but uh, then, then we go into the screening room, and also, I forgot to mention, John Glenn was there, and, and, and there were a few other astronauts there. And John Glenn is sitting at the end of the row. They're just small rows of about, oh, I don't know, about eight seats. They're not too many rows. And during the launch sequence, Tom is sitting to my left, and he kind of taps 
you know, taps my shoulder and he points down the row and I look over and there's John Glenn and he's gripping the handrest. <laughs> and I realize, oh my God, this, this guy's reliving his own moment of being on the launch pad. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, a little drain, name dropping. <laughs> President Clinton, John Glenn, you know, hanging out at a urinal. You know, it's a lot, a lot okay. of fun. I think that's, that's officially my favorite convention story ever. I'm going to have to remember that one. Just hanging out. <laughs> hanging it out, I guess I should say. How's your hammer hanging? Well, we have some very eager fans out in the audience to ask some questions. So, uh, Bernie, Mike 3, where are you, Bernie? Uh, over here. Uh, it's not actually... Hi. Uh, it's not actually a question. It's more of a statement. You hydra bastard. <laughs> Hey, Hydra. <laughs> Actually, they're going to change the name of the show. <laughs> Agents of Hydra. You know, I mean, it's it's got a lot catchier title. Yeah, I, I you know what? I I like those Agents of Shield, but they're just a little too square for me. If you know what I mean. Jason, Mike one. <laughs> Hi, Bill. Over here. Okay. Yes, you Hydra <laughs> bastard. <laughs> <laughs> You've had so many great characters with memorable lines, but what is your favorite line? They mostly come out at night. <laughs> mostly. That's Scott down here, Mike too. Yeah. Uh, hey, Bill. I just wanted to ask, uh, you've had some of the most epic death scenes. Do you have a favorite? You can compete with Sean Bean on that level, actually. Hmm. Hmm. Gee. Uh, you know, I'm, nothing's coming to mind right off the bat. I, I, uh, I'm trying to think when I died last. I guess I died a few weeks ago. Let's see. Uh, no, no. I, I've... Uh, well, it seemed like the Aliens one was kind of a great one because I got to kind of go down Audie Murphy style. I mean, let's face it, you know, Hudson was wrapped a little too tight for the mission and, he, you know, and, and, you know, his cowardly tendencies kind of came out for most of the thing, but at least he got to go down like a man, you know, doing that, you know, you want some of this? Hey, <laughs> that was my, yeah, my uh, Bob De Niro moment. Hey, you want some of this? <laughs> you, you alien, fuck you. Oh, shit! <laughs> Thank you. Have, you. have you ever played a character you don't like? Oh, uh, yeah. You can, yeah, you can play characters you don't like, but, but as an actor, you, you, you never judge the character you're playing. So, as far as I'm concerned, all the characters I've played, good and bad, they think they're good. You know, they're, you know I don't think people think, oh, I'm a bad guy. They just, and I find that the villains usually have a lot more, con, they're, they've got a lot more uh, courage of their convictions than the heroes. Usually the hero's the guy who has to kind of rise to the occasion, and the villain's already risen. <laughs> <laughs> Elijah, down mic two. Um, yeah. So what is your favorite scene in Apollo 13? Let's see. My favorite scene in Apollo 13... Hmm. Let's see. What's your favorite scene? Um. Take your time. There's no rush. I well, think this. I think the launch scene. Yeah, I think that launch sequence is pretty badass. Uh, yeah, it really is. Cool, man. Cool. I gotta say too, uh, the zero gravity stuff that we did in there uh, was really a unique experience. We. Um, we got to go down to space camp in Huntsville for a couple days, and then they, 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 they took us over. This was uh, Gary Sinise, Kevin Bacon, Tom Hanks, Ron Howard, and myself. And then we got to go over down to Houston, and we got to go up in the, uh, uh, the uh, Vomit Comet, this old 707, it's aptly named, I must say. And uh, we got to go up with some other astronaut trainees. And it's a really cool plane. I don't know if you've ever seen it on, in any documentaries, but it's only got like 10 rows of seats in the back of the plane. The rest of the front of the plane's all empty and kind of padded. 
it goes up to 39,000 feet and then they pull the yoke back and, it, and they do what they call these parabolic arches. And as from the top of the arch for 30 seconds, you're in kind of a free fall. So it's really an artificial gravity. Basically the plane is falling so fast, it's compensating for, for the pull of the gravity and creates a weightlessness. If you've ever been in a plane crash, well, you kind of know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Oof, I thought of a dark joke, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> But, but we got to do that, and that was really a cool experience, uh, except when they, say, they, they would say 30 down. And when they said 30 down, that meant they were going to pull the yoke back, come out of the dive, and you practically triple your own body weight from the G-force. And the best way to take the Gs is, is lying down, so you kind of take them through your body this way. If you're standing up and you take those Gs, it feels like you're growing gills. And, um, yeah, there was a lot of vomit floating around that thing. I'm sensing a theme with this panel. I don't know. Yeah, we have kind of a theme going here. I think we do, yeah. Right. Thanks for your question. Uh, Lynn, mic three. You're up. These are powerful uh, mics. You mentioned that you really like doing villains. Uh, and may I commend you on your ability to do so. Um, your character in Big Love. Would you consider him to be a villain no. in that show? No, no, not at all. Would you consider him to be a villain? A little bit. I don't, yeah, I, no, this is, this, you know, what you have with, with what's interesting about Big Love is, you know, people say, oh, it's a show about a polygamist. Well, really, no, it's a show about four adults who've entered into a marriage contract. And let's face it, we live in a modern modern world, and there's all kinds of, you know, groupings of people who decide to live together, you know, same-sex couples, uh, couples from other religions and cultures, and polygamy's been around, it's in the Bible, it's been around forever, there are all kinds of cultures uh, that today that still practice polygamy. So uh, I think to think of me as a villain in that is to kind of be a bit Victorian in a way. And, and kind of, I, Just I, to clarify, it's not the polygamy I had a problem with. Hmm. <laughs> what, what did you have a problem with? More business practices. Oh, well, so. yes, yeah, <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did, I, I you know, I, I did get my back against the wall there, and, and I did do a few unscrupulous things. I think the worst thing I did on the show really was uh, when I kind of threw my, uh, my business partner under the bus so that the store wouldn't go down. But you know, it was, it was for the greater good. <laughs> Thank you. Tony on mic two, you're up. She had me sweating a bit there. They got, they got my name wrong. Never mind. Um, hi, Bill. I'm, I actually storyboarded for you on The Colony, where you played yet another villain. And speaking of villains, i got to know, how far in advance, when you read for the role for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., did you know what you were going to become? Wait, I didn't hear the first part of that. Oh, I just, I storyboarded you on The Colony. Oh, what? fantastic, yeah. Uh, yeah. You what? actually played a villain in that oh, one. Oh, so yes. I, well, I, I don't line. know if I was a villain. I just had kind of a... Uh, see, again, I had kind of a Darwinian outlook on life, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> you made it work. You made it work. Darwinian. All right. Okay, how often do you get to say that? Yes, I have a rather Darwinian outlook. <laughs> Kill or be killed. Uh, so, uh, when I signed up for S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, I knew a little bit, because I... I yeah, I, I had, I, I kind of knew a little bit. I didn't know ultimately where it was going to go, but I, I had a pretty good idea of the general direction it was headed. What? You wanted it to go that way. Admit it. I did. <laughs> I did. God, I'm sick of playing straight, guys. I got a belly full of it. Yeah, no, it's much more fun to, I feel like you can see it in the performance itself from when I go from Agent John Garrett to, you know, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. to John Garrett, Hail Hydra. It's just a whole other thing, you know. It's like, uh, you know, 
It's, a, it's, it's very liberating. I hated playing that game like I was all buddy-buddy with them and stuff. And, you know, it's, God, what a bore. <laughs> and Saffron Burroughs, I did feel a little pang of guilt when she got it. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Steve, mic one. Hey, Bill. Welcome to Calgary. Thank you. Um, there seems to be some debate on your side whether or not you're a villain in many of these movies. That's uh, more, true. More to the point, you like being a badass more? <laughs> the ultimate badass. So, given that, in the history of all your movies, by the way, Chet was the best. He was badass. It's like this group right here loves Chet. The Chet fan club. Um, what character in any other franchise would you like to play that you haven't had a chance to yet? The Joker. Oh my God. Wait till they get a load of me. Why so serious? Something like that. Something that had some theatricality and some relish and <laughs> maybe some extra mustard. Would, would the Joker say, you're all gonna die, man? Yes, but he might say it more like, you're all gonna die, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Start a petition, guys. That, he, was a, he was a plant. Sorry. <laughs> Rich, Mike 3. Hey, Bill. First of all, happy 30th anniversary for Streets of Fire and Terminator. 30th anniversary on both, man. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, I, 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 I lost count a long time <laughs> ago. Those right. residual checks kind of are down to like 50 cents now, so... They don't really grab my attention. All right, so let's see. You had some of the most outrageous hair in your movies. Yes. Clyde the bartender, big pompadour. Mm. You got Terminator with the blue spiky hair. Of course, Chet, the best buzz cut in the history of cinematic Absolutely. history. Absolutely. So which was your favorite hairdo? I would have to say Chet wins that trifecta. Uh, and I'll tell you a story about that haircut. If you got about three hours. Uh, no, I would. There was a guy named Michael Germain. He actually was the hairstylist for Streets of Fire, and he always kind of wore his hair in kind of a '50s style, kind of really waxed on the sides, and and uh, he had he had one of those mustaches that that was that he curled up on the end. And I started shooting. The, I only shot one scene in uh, Highland Park. The movie started shooting on location in Chicago for about two weeks. Then it all came back to uh, Universal Studios. And the, and the Donnelly House, the interior of the Donnelly House, was later the same stage. I think it's stage 24. It's one of the older stages on the lot. It was where Mission Control was for Apollo. So that was kind of cool. But anyway, uh, we, were in the, we were in the makeup and hair trailer. They had, we had figured out, you know, I'd had the wardrobe, I'd put it all on, but I just felt like, you know, the mil you know we'd come up with all this stuff. I, had, John Hughes and I had kind of figured out the idea that, when, you know, Chet's probably home from military college, and, uh, but the hair was not decided on. And I just felt like I looked okay with the camouflage gear on, and, and we're talking about the scene where I come back from the duck hunting, it's the next day after the crazy party, and I get out of the car, and I've got the shotgun in one hand, and this duck in the other, and I see the Maserati and the Ferrari, and I'm walking into the house. And uh, so I said to Michael Germain, I, I, man, I need a haircut that's going to really, really set this thing on fire. God, somebody keeps calling me. Good Lord, it must be an emergency of, of, of huge proportions. Oh, good Lord, it's my son James. Well, yeah, Christ. Hey, James, I'm I'm doing a panel in front of a couple thousand people here. What's up? What what do you what, what's going on?
You lost the apartment key? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll get into that later. Okay. Okay. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> See you, Val. Well. Okay. He's great. You know, he's 20. He's like a cub bear playing with his Peter. You know, just these damn kids. <laughs> That's a line I, I'd like to use. Anyway, getting back to the long hair story. So I talked Michael, he said, you're going to get me fired, but he suggested this flat top that he remembered this kid having in high school. He was, he was kind of a child of the 50s, and that he had it really flat on top, but kind of long on the sides and waxed. And I said, that's it, give it to me. He said, well, we got to get John or the Hughes or the producer, Joel Silver, to, to sign off. And I go, trust me, just fucking do it. And he said, oh, okay, god dang it, you're going to get me fired. So we did it. So I wanted to walk on set as Chet. I didn't want to kind of go and ask permission, and I wanted to own this thing. So I walked on the set with this haircut and that outfit and the duck and the shotgun, and, and John Hughes just about fell out of the director's chair. He, he was like smitten. In fact, he was so smitten that when he, when he wrote Home Alone, he basically wrote the, the, the older brother as Chet in that movie. I forgot the actor who played that. Anyway. Thanks for that long ass question. <laughs> and now we have Jesus. Tony. Hi, Bill. Thanks for coming to Calgary. Thanks. It's good to be um, here. You appeared in probably my favorite movie of all time when I was 10 years old. And I've always wanted to go back to the Great West or Old West there. And I was just wondering what experiences or whatever Tombstone. you got from Tombstone. It, literally is my favorite movie. Well, you know, thank you. Tombstone was a great, great ensemble, but the, I think the credit for Tombstone really goes to Kevin Jar, who wrote the, the screenplay and was the original director of, of the movie, but was fired four weeks in. I, I, he never I recovered from the blow, and, and he died of a heroin overdose a few years ago, and it was a real tragic, tragic thing. But I can never think of Tombstone without Kevin, because he was the one who cast all of us. He had us all down to um, Tucson to work uh, bef before in pre-production. We did all the table reads. He was very meticulous about every item of clothing and prop that we were going to use in the film. And uh, he was a very elegant man himself. He almost felt like he was a guy from the 19th century. And the reason you, you, you like that movie so much I think is because of his work, all that stuff, all those, all those expressions. I'm your Huckleberry. Must be a, must be a beach of a hand. All that stuff, skin that smoke wagon. All that stuff was stuff that he had found. Not only in his, re he did incredible research. You know, the devil is in the details. To me, many films, they become kind of cliches because. You know, they say that the mother of all cliches is lack of research, but he went back into personal diaries and family letters to find all that, that stuff when he put that together. He also wrote another great uh, 19th century film that uh, won Denzel Washington the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, a picture called Glory. If you haven't seen that, it's a really good movie. But um, uh, I saw him, I flew up here with Michael Rooker. He was one of the cowboys there. Couldn't figure out which side of the fence he was on. And, uh, and I, I sat dinner with Michael Bean last night, you know, Johnny Ringo there. And uh, we had a lot of fun. And that's a movie that everywhere I go, you know, particularly the men, they like to talk about Tombstone. So thanks for mentioning that. And a mem memory to Kevin Jar. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left, so just a few more questions. Chris, Mike, too. Hey, Bill. So uh, one of my favorite pieces of movie trivia is what actor has been killed by a Terminator, a Predator, and an alien? The answer, of course, being Bill Paxton. I always thought I survived my Terminator encounter. Maybe I was a little, I hobbled after that a little bit. <laughs> So um, you've had a long time collaboration with James Cameron. Mm -hmm. So how did that begin, and why do you think you became such a go-to performer for him? 
I was lucky, first of all, for sure, uh, to meet Jim and to end up, you know, having the bat phone ring and having him on the other line several times. But uh, I met Jim in 1980 on a movie that was released. It was called The Quest when we made it. Um, that's the same time I met Gail Ann Hurd, Steve Quayle, who's got a great movie coming out that's kind of the heir apparent to Twister called Into the Storm which you guys are going to love. Uh, he was there. We were all, you know, we were all working for Roger Corman for, you know, like a, you know, a bag of coal a day. And, uh, but it was a hell of an experience, Roger Corman being the only feature filmmaker who, was, who, would hi who could hire non-union. So it was a, it was a great uh, recruiting ground for filmmakers and a great education to all of us. Um, I met, I met, uh, Jim through a buddy of mine who's from Canada, an actor named uh, Phil Granger, and Phil was working on the on this on the on the movie. They just started building the sets, and uh, I was looking for a job. And he said, "Hey, you got to come down and meet this guy, Jim Cameron. He's you know I could probably get you on the night crew." So I went down there, and uh, and so Phil introduced me to Jim, and Jim said, "Why?" Well, Phil told me you worked on in the art department on some other Roger Corman films. I said, "Yeah." He said, uh, well, can you, can you start right away? I said, uh, you, you mean right now? He said, yeah, go paint that wall over there. <laughs> and uh, as we were working on these sets in the middle of the night, um, I started getting to know Jim, and he started opening up to me and telling me about some of his dreams and ambitions as a filmmaker, and particularly telling me how he was writing a, a movie about a cyborg from the future that was going to come back to the present to assassinate a woman who was going to give birth to a son who was going to lead a revolution against the machines. And I went, far out, Jim. Uh, but, uh, and it kind of started there. And, and I, he, I, I made a short at the time that I was able to sell to Saturday Night Live. And uh, it was called Fish Heads. Eat them up, yum. And, and so Jim kind of took an interest in me, and we became friends, and we both shared a, a, an interest in scuba diving, and we did a little of that together, and, and it just kind of came from there. Uh, the aliens connection was kind of wild. I, I had met my, well, she was my girlfriend there, my wife of 27 years, uh, in London a couple years before. And, and, and I went, I was going to catch a flight to London to see her at Christmas. We were doing this whole long distance thing for about five years. And I see Jim handing off something to somebody in the line. This is before they had, you know, security and stuff. You could walk right up to the gate. And I said, Jim, Jim, what are you doing? He said, I've, I've, been, I've been hired to write and direct the sequel to Alien. And I was like, oh my God, fantastic, man. And then it wasn't until the, ne the next July, I, I read for it on July 4th over there. And it's, funnily enough, they don't celebrate the 4th of July in England. I don't know why. <laughs> why is that? Uh, and I went out and read for it, and then I didn't hear back. And you know, your friends are usually the last people to hire you because you just have no mystique with your friends. They, they, know, your, they know your shtick. And I thought, ah, you know, I would love to have done it, but... And then I, it's a month later, and I get a call from my agent, and she, she said, uh, what do you call a ball that's been kind of hit out of the way? I go, you mean left field? He goes, yeah, left field. You're going to get a call from Jim Cameron in about five minutes. He's going to offer you the role of Hudson. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and uh, I, weirdly enough, I, I, was, I was in negotiation to sign up for a police academy, too. So, it was a really hard decision to make. Hmm, Police Academy 2, ooh, that's tempting. Aliens. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I'm going to go with aliens. Hell yeah, I'm going to go with aliens! We're all very glad that you did. All right, we've got time for one more question. Robin, mic one. Uh, hey, Bill. Welcome to Calgary, by the way. Thank uh, you. This probably isn't going to be quite as, uh, you know, in-depth as some of the other questions. It's all right. But um, you did some work with the guys from Broken Lizard. Oh. And <laughs> you did Coconut Pete, which I'm wondering how you ended up in that role. And is he still upset about Margaritaville versus Pina Colada Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Well, uh, 
Coconut Pete was kind of a um, poor man's Jimmy Buffett character, and the guys Broken Lizard had made a film called Super Troopers. I don't know if you guys know it. And I, and I saw that film, and uh, I, I don't get cast to do a lot of co comedic roles. And, um, and, I, and so I, I, there was an opportunity there. There wasn't much money in it or anything, but I, I, I loved the character. And it was a challenge to play this kind of, you know, aging rock guy who had like this one-hit wonder deal and had this island where he let these co-eds come down and party and stuff. And uh, so we all went down to Mexico. We shot at a place called Tamarindo. It was in the off-season. We took over this whole resort down there. And it was crazy because it was in the middle of monsoon season. Uh, Brittany Daniels it went home for the weekend, and while she was gone, a palm tree fell on her cabana. <laughs> now, that would have been a tragedy. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> Damn! But uh, but we had a great time making that, and those guys were uh, those guys were were really egging me on, as it were, and and uh, playing this guy who's kind of this Bacallian kind of founder of the Fees character. He's he's you know half in the bag all the time. It was was really wonderful, really wonderful. And I remember we were all sitting in a hot tub down there, and this was before filming. And I was trying to find the voice for this guy, and. And it was about the time, uh, you know, I was thinking of Sam Elliott, who I'd done Tombstone with, and he was doing, the, you know, the beef ads, you know, beef, it's what's for dinner. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, I could kind of play on that. And I was kind of like, Brittany, it's what's for dinner. <laughs> so, <laughs> she's what's for dinner. Oh, God. So I, it was, you, could, you could tell I didn't have any fun on that, on that show. So thanks for, for remembering. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Paxton. Thanks for the memories. Thanks for the memories. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.